Hi, Juan Camilo. You can share your screen. Do you want me to interrupt you when you have five minutes? Okay, can you listen to me now? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Hernan, can you put it on full screen, please? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. So thank you so much for all of you for participating in this uh, meeting. I, I, I really appreciate uh, your time and being present in all of these lectures. So today we are going to, or I'm going to present certain advances that I made when I was doing certain research regarding the history of physical chemistry and its relationship to the development of quantum chemistry in the Edelstein collection in Israel. And the paper um, aims to understand certain ideas that were developed before the establishment of the theory of Gilbert Newton Lewis of balance and molecular structure representation. So just to introduce currently within the scope of philosophy of chemistry, uh, the case that quantum chemistry provides has been explored like in different ways. However, there seems to be a kind of consensus that there is something alien within the molecular uh, descriptions of quantum chemistry with respect to its purely quantum mechanical counterpart. Next, please, uh, Hernan. So in order to, to depict this, this idea, I just put this quotation by Bo Jens, theoretical quantum chemist from South Africa, that reveals what, what is commonly said in philosophy of chemistry, that there is a kind of quantum and classical views of molecules that are uh, apart from each other, and that in chemistry, just the, the, the classical view of molecules has been really popular. And that uh, graphing, those uh, variables or classical inputs of molecular chemistry, um, let's say, breaks what is quantum of that description. Uh, this question has been, let's say, response from, from different perspectives. In our forthcoming book, we are editing. Uh, Klaus asks precisely the opposite question. How chemical is quantum chemistry? And uh, you can check the, the opposite side of the question, that is how, how much quantum chemistry is founded on chemistry. So we will see what those authors need to say, I hope, uh, soon enough this year. So although the history of quantum chemistry and its development as a subdiscipline has been extensively studied from the Haydel and London paper and the extension of that paper, and development of trial wake functions from Pauline and Mulliken, uh, I will say that little is known about the relationship between the old quantum theory of Bohr mainly and Lewis's structural ideas for chemical substances. Uh, I'm putting like the emphasis there because I'm really interested in how chemists um, develop theory in this uh, interdisciplinary space like biochemistry, physical chemistry, and so on. Uh, the purpose of this article, as I said, is, is recover the influence of Alfred Parsons' works in the development of Lewis' ideas concerning the chemical aspects of Bohr's theory, a reason for or a physical mechanism for electron pairing, and the reconciliation between two conflicting theories about the dynamics of electrons in atoms and molecules. It's important to say that the words of Lewis settled our own modern understanding of chemical bonds and the representation or models to depict um, molecular structures using uh, Lewis dots kind of structures. So Lewis program was expanded and developed on his 1923 book, uh, Balance and the Structure of Atoms and Molecules. And uh, around those years, uh, Alfred Parson was a Harvard student that was really noted by his only paper called the magnetic or the magneton theory of the atom. Parson was uh, at the same University of Lewis when he was the chair of physical chemistry, the chair of chemistry 
of Berkeley uh, around 1916. So during, during these years, Lewis had certain contact with Parsons' work, which uh, in particular argued that the electron in Bohr's model might be a ring of negative electricity spinning. Uh, you can stay there where you were right there. Thank you. With a high velocity, uh, not back, thank you. Uh, with a high velocity and that a chemical bond results from the pairing of those, those, those magnetons uh, between two atoms. The problem was that at the beginning of the 20th century, two different representations of the electron within the atom with, were put forward. Chemists favored like a static electron, whereas physicists endowed electrons with rapid uh, motion. Louis suggests to just um, a static atom where electrons occupy the vertices of a series of cubes. This qualitative representation of the atom was of great advantage for the explanation of chemical bond, uh, bonding. Yeah. Bohr, on the other side, developed uh, his mathematical model in which electrons were rotating around the nuclei in a stable orbits that satisfy certain quantum conditions, in particular Planck's con constant. And this dynamic representation of the atom was supported uh, with data coming from spectroscopy, spectroscopy you know, mainly Rydberg series and the fine uh, structure of hydrogen spectra. So now I'm going to present these two conceptualizations more in detail and show how the conflict uh, was overcome. Next, please, Selena. So first, I'm going to introduce the, the ideas of the dynamic electron regarding solving the, the problem of molecular structure. Thanks to his theoretical methods developed in 1930, Bohr devoted the, the third part of that work to the problem of molecular structure. Bohr presented the tentative structure for certain molecules. And the central element of Bohr model, as I said, was the introduction of Planck's constant to classical electrodynamics in order to explain the, the size of the atom and to correct uh, the radiative instability of Rutherford's atom. Bohr was like really confident regarding his chemical or the chemical aspects of his own theory. Uh, because he, he was able to explain with this mechanism why two hydrogen atoms will uh, combine into, a, into a, a, a full molecule. And uh, what he refers as chemical combination is that the greater part of the electrons must be like arranged, arranged around each nuclei approximately as if the other nucleus were absent. You can see like in these representations, how this model works. The black dots represents the atomic nuclei and in the middle is spinning between uh, those atomic nuclei, the electrons are fastly revolving. And that's the representation of Bohr's um, model of, of bonding. No, we have hydrogen molecule, oxygen molecule, and below of that, the molecule of of water. So next, Hernan, uh, please. One of the important parts is that the Bohr model was uh, able to calculate heats of formation and dissociation for hydrogen molecules that was in agreement with the best uh, measured measurements of that uh, uh, physical chemical quantity made by Irving Lamour. However, regarding to the questions of the Bonsin methane, Methane, Bohr wrote that the closer discussion of such questions of bigger molecules was uh, really apart or outside his own theory. However, Bohr's, Bohr's theory presented like a big conceptual step forward in chemistry, being, I would say, the first physical theory for the role played by electrons on bonding. His conception of bonding as consisting of two rings of uh, two or more revolving electrons was a dynamical theory, but it was really complicated for chemistry or chemists at that time, maybe too complex and really limited on his value of application because mainly 
organic chemistry uh, was related with covalent bonds or covalent compounds, but this theory was almost of no use. So the idea of moving electrons within the atom was centrally implicated in the empirical of success of Bohr's model, such the correction of the Rydberg constant and the final structure of the hydrogen atom. This, of course, could not be easily dismissed, especially by a physical chemist such Lewis. Rather, Lewis tried to attempt uh, to, to show these problems of the dynamic conception of the electron uh, to fight physics on its own ground, as the other Arabats say. For that, Lewis argued that the motion of electrons in Bohr model has no physical effect whatsoever. And an additional difficulty was, according to Bohr, that according to Bohr, the revolution of the electrons must continue even down to the absolute zero of temperature. Lewis believed that relationships similar or the similar conclusions uh, obtained in Bohr's theory may be obtained even if we substitute the orbital atom of Bohr with this static atom. Next, Erna. So here I'm going to introduce what was actually the work of Alfred Parson. The essential assumption of what makes uh, the theory of Parson interesting was the, that the electron is in itself a magnetic entity having, in addition to its negative charge, the properties of a circuit of the same order of magnitude of the size of the atom. So you can see here um, two basic models. The hydrogen molecule in the upper left corner in which there is a positive sphere, the outside sphere, and inside uh, the magneton is revolving with certain characteristics. So this rotation of a ring shape is intended to replace the usual conception of rotating rings of electron in providing the orbital motion of electricity. And with that, uh, Parson obtained a certain kind of model about the hydrogen molecule as a pairing, as pairing sorry, of two magnetons. Uh, Parson, although following, I will say, Bohr's trend, he tried to calculate the heat of dissociation of this hydrogen molecule, and he obtained a, a value higher than those calculated by Irving Lamb. Parson was in contact with Lewis too, so he had on his mind that there were something interesting regarding the group of eight electrons, and he developed this uh, toy model in which he represents the structure of a cube atom with eight electrons, oh, sorry, with eight magnetons in every corner. No? The black rings are the magnetons and the uh, silver rings are the, um, the, um, the positive uh, sphere of the molecule. And then he tried using different current to produce certain uh, magnetic properties on, on this disposition and try to give a certain uh, support, empirical support through this model to the idea of the octet rule of, of Lewis. So um, next, please, Hernan. So you can see here that he was trying, sorry that someone is trying to enter and he just pop up in my screen. Okay, so um, the important part of, of Parsons' models was that he was trying to see how different uh, um, electric inputs can uh, vary the disposition of the magnetons in a space, just to try to see how those magnetons can interact with other magnetons in order to describe how a molecule can be structured in a space. Uh, next slide, please. However, uh, as, as a co-worker of Lewis, uh, Parson was trying to, let's say, oppose himself to the idea of revolving electrons. In general, he go to the stereochemical evidence for that 
I will say he claims that stereochemistry gives an evidence for an ex definite spatial arrangement of the group of the group attached to a carbon or to other atoms. And this makes it very unlikely that the valence electrons can be take part in the rapid orbit motion. So in order to describe a stereochemical uh, aspect in organic chemistry, Parsons and Lewis uh, ask it for a very static position of the electrons. So he said he continued to fully appreciate his, this difficulty of Bohr's model in which Bohr considers the trahedral carbons, we see that their theory comes to a complete halt when confronted with the problems of chemistry in a space, as he called it, the chemistry. Siguiente, Hernán, please. Sorry, Camilo, te quedan cinco. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we are done, almost ready. Um, so Lewis was the first uh, to think about cubic atoms, however, his ideas were developed in 1902, but we can see certain coincidences regarding the works of Parsons. Lewis suggested a model of the atom by considering at least the new ide ideas on the constitution of matter, mainly J.J. Thompson uh, ideas regarding electrons, and Alfred Parsons' idea of magnetons. So in the Lewis model, uh, electrons are, um, located at the vertices, vertices of su successive concentric cones. You can see here an example. I gave you the model of the argon atom uh, of his book on 1923. The number is cut there. So you can see the structure of noble gases are full of it in the two, in the inner cube and the outside cube. So Lewis cubic model provide a kind of qualitative explanation of the periodic table. The periodicity in the properties of the chemical elements resulted from a corresponding periodicity in the structure of their respective atoms. You can see in the first row in the upper part, the line from lithium to fluorine, how you can uh, reconstruct certain periods of the periodic table using that. Even uh, Lewis show his periodic table, it's not like the intention of my paper to work on, on those those ideas. So, um, and with this idea of cubes, Lewis uh, was able to develop a mechanism for the single bonds, the first mechanism, ABC, you know, sharing of two pairs of electrons uh, between cubes. And in the second situation, he was able to reconstruct double, double bonds, not two pairs, of electrons shared together. But more important, and the influence of Parson was this red square I show you there. Uh, these magnetons allow to accommodate triple bonds and the tetrahedral structure of, of, of those bonds. Because if you have cubes, you cannot like connect it in such a way that you can have like uh, triple bonds or three pairs of electron shared. So in Lewis' 1916 theory, only part of the atom was involved in chemical phenomena. There was like this inner core that was surrounded by these shelled electrons. Uh, next, Hernan, please. Um, but in order to, to have this configuration, the configuration I show you in this red square, the electrons at the small distances could not interact via Coulomb's law, no? So in his axiomatic description of the theory of atomic structure in his sixth postulate, he says very clearly that electric forces between particles which are very close together do not obey the simple law of inverse squares which holds at greater distances. He was like denying or giving up an established physical law in order to deprive the electron of motion. His motivation for doing so um, can be understood in his 1917 paper, The Static Atom. Uh, the aim of that paper was to discuss precisely the relationship between the atomic structure and the valent bonds by which the atom are regarded that tied together to form the more complicated structure of molecules. 
And he wanted to justify the, the, his fundamental postulate or the postulate of his theory that the atom is inertially at rest or nil resolved. He entered at one field. So in the meantime, Lewis' static model of the atom was articulated further and widely publicized by uh, Irving Lamoury. However, from the point of view of physicists, of a physicist, like a new representation of the atom. Sorry, that's some, something mm, Also, had some unseemly feature, features. It dispenses with orbital motion and introduces instead an ad hoc quantum force. This is Irving Lamb's Lamb Moore works for keeping the atom of, from collapsing. Uh, in his chapter of the 1923 book, Reconciliation of the Two Views, the Arrangement of Electrons in the Atom, he claimed that was the orbit as a whole rather than the particular position of the electron within the orbit that is the thing of essential interest of both theory. If, the, if these orbits are in fixed position and orientations, they might be used as the building stuff of an atom that has an essentially aesthetic character. The justification offered by Lewis, I would say, was based on the phenomena of isomerism of organic compounds. Lewis claimed that it seems inconceivable that electrons which have any part in determining the structure of such a molecule could possess proper motion, whether orbital or chaotic or any uh, of any uh, appreciable amplitude. Instead, we must assume rather that those electrons are held in the atom in fixed equilibrium positions about which they might experience minute or small oscillation. Thus, the idea that electrons in atoms or molecules could not possess proper motion was backed by chemical evidence. Next, I'm just going to this part. So for physicists, uh, the difference between the chemists and physicists models can be understood if we take into account that they were different parts of background knowledge that constrained that theorizing. Theor theorizing. For instance, for physicists, the consistent of atomic models with Coulomb law was like a sine qua non condition. And on the other hand, for chemists, on Coulomb's law was not an in a, like uh, an important part or a constraint of the two. The two communities had different attitudes towards mathematization. Physicists valued mathematical models where chemistry, chemists were either indifferent toward them or distrust them altogether. Finally, the two communities had different attitudes toward experimental evidence depending on its origin. Chemists neglected the facts of physical experimentation, and physicists ignored, following Lewis, the facts of chemical combination. So, to, just to finish, uh, with this thorny conflict out of the way, Lewis could not, like, could now put center or in the center of the stage, his main, his main innovation that was a novel account of the chemical bond um, and the um, unification of what um, polar and not polar substances or the kind of um, bond that those substances contain uh, could be explained using uh, his own theory. This idea of introduction, introducing magnetism on, on Lewis ideas was really important for later developments of certain parts of chemistry. In general, his magnetochemical theory for the description of uh, free radicals in terms of molecular uh, of um, electrons. And uh, the magnetic properties um, of certain chemical substances allow him to obtain certain values of magnetic susceptibility that he was uh, after referring on his book on thermodynamics in order to speak about the color of organic uh, substances. So what I was trying to say is that the influence of 
Alfred Parson and Lewis ideas was the one who possibilitated this uh, reconciliation between the dynamic um, description of the electron on Bohr's atomic model and the static atom postulated by um, Gilbert Newton Lewis. I hope I didn't took too much time of, of the presentation, but that's it. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Camilo. Great talk. Yep. Uh, we still have uh, three minutes for questions. So, if you, there is a question from Julian Stern, or and um, first Olympia has a question. Then I'm going to read Julio if there is time. Very short, Camilo. Uh, at that time, everybody knows that a, a charge in motion, I mean, accelerated, emits energy and cannot be stable. We know the solution, Bohr's answer, because he would say that energy cannot be emitted in continuously. What was the answer from Parsons? The same as Bohr? Or he had uh, regarding radiation of this this motion, he was not like really interested in. He he make a certain promise because he had just one paper, 1915, and at the final of that paper, he has like certain promise in order to resolve this radiation kind of situations with his magnetic cubic model. But he didn't went like too deep into that, actually. So uh, I really cannot answer. <laughs> that question for him. Well, he didn't answer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we still have one and a half minutes. So Julio, if you like, you can open your microphone. Okay. So I'm interested in the history of many things, including uh -huh. the history <coughs> of technology and semiconductor devices. In yes. order to make uh, diodes and, and transistors, researchers in this area only needed to see the flows of electrons and holes in semiconductors. And, but they were completely unable to visualize that and, and they couldn't develop <clears throat> those devices until, until the late 40s when they, the uh, Heisenberg it introduced the notion of hole in a semiconductor. But it always seems to me that, that the theory of the electron and, and lattices as conceptualized by Lewis and Langmuir uh, could allow uh, uh, people to, to see the flows of electrons and holes that they needed to, but that never happened. Can you give me... Uh, uh, some ideas about this, these thoughts? Oh, Julio, like really, I, 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 this is just the best of my knowledge. I will say that uh, the problem was actually the energy of hydrogen, uh, of the hydrogen molecule, no? Uh, the replacement of these ideas of classical chemistry was due precisely because Hayden and Lodlock solved the problem of the hydrogen molecule and obtaining a very good, um, um, uh, values for for kids of dissociation of hydrogen molecules. So maybe the reason was the replacement of of these ideas, and that uh, Lewis model just keep itself to a shortcut for education and and certain classifications. But I, I really don't know why this this model didn't went through. Maybe because this magnetical theory or magnetical ideas of Lewis were not so well known. I would say. Right. Thank you. Gracias, Julio. Okay, so we have run out of time. Sorry, Eric, but maybe right. you can. I, I will be. I will be in the coffee. I will be in the coffee break. Sorry, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry for taking Thank you, Camilo. Much.